so uh, screen share is disabled. <laughs> so if I can, uh, this can be enabled for me so I can share the screen. You're having, you said you're having issues sharing your screen? Yeah, it's disabled. Okay, I'm making you co-host, so. Are you able to share it now? Let me try. Yes, perfect. Great. All right, uh, so I'll share the whole screen. Uh, yeah, I hope people can see my screen. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, um, right, yeah, so I'll discuss neuromorphic computing, as uh, Bob said, and then particularly I'll discuss neuromorphic computing using an interesting type of device. Uh, it's called a memory stiff device, and I'll we'll also talk about what new materials that actually make this device interesting and make the system uh, work. So uh, yeah, so this is actually Bob was uh, alluding to uh, earlier, right? So, um, so we want to have more efficient computers and over the years, uh, things have been uh, improving significantly. This is mostly due to Moore's law, uh, simply by making the device smaller, uh, it become faster, cheaper, and more powerful. Uh, but now we seem to hit a bottleneck. Uh, the reason is twofold. So first, uh, scaling is reaching a physical limit, right? And right now we are hearing five nanometers on two nanometer devices, right? So we are basically hitting the physical limit. Uh, there are the sizes you can make, uh, and also there's a uh, tunneling effects and other non-ideal effects that prevent the device from being working well at such small uh, scales. But that's actually just one problem. Uh, the other problem is this uh, so-called von Neumann bottleneck. I'm sure you all know this, right? So you can make the transistor smaller, you can make the circuit faster, but that's just the logic part. But now we are dealing with, for example, neural nets, uh, and there are a lot of data that need to be processed at a very sh a short time scale. And uh, there just need to be a lot of data need to be moved around. And, um, uh, but in a con conventional computer, you have this uh, logic unit, but all the data are stored separately in a memory. And the, most of the case, the memory, the se separate chip from your logic chip. So to move this data back and forth between the two systems actually kill the performance. So you can make the logic really fast, but your overall system throughput uh, is determined by this bus between your logic and memory. And that also consume a lot of energy. That's why the computers are getting hotter, or the computing chips are getting hotter, and the, the speed is kind of reached a, a, a bottleneck. Uh, but this is actually uh, getting worse because now uh, the software guys are developing bigger and bigger uh, algorithms and models that need to be run efficiently on this hardware. So, uh, uh, for example, over the last uh, uh, maybe uh, a few years, right? So we we found that the the um, uh, the the um, the power compute power improves, say, uh, uh, of the models improved by uh, say 35 fold, but the the required compute um, hardware actually needs to improve by orders many orders magnitude. Simply, we don't have the compute power uh, needed to support the large models developed by the hard, uh, software people, right? So, um, so for this, people are forced to look at differently. For example, looking at uh, the the most efficient computer we know, this is actually the, the brain, right? The brain of a mammal, and it's very efficient uh, because it doesn't have this problem. Uh, in a brain, we have the memory co-located with the logic, right? The same device both act as a memory but also as a processed data. Uh, it also offers so-called very fine green parallelism, so very high degree of parallelism. And it also processes data differently instead of digitally it process data analog, uh, in an analog fashion. And instead of producing, uh, processing continuous data, it processes data in uh, specs, right, uh, discrete specs. Um, so there are some arguments whether the, the later two properties are really that critical, but the first two are really, really important that differentiate from this system with the other system. So, uh, so, th so that's why a lot of companies are, are, are basically starting to look very seriously on this so-called a new computing hardware that can map the neural network models more efficiently. Um, and uh, there are just a few examples. For, for example, there's a system uh, by IBM called TrueNorth, and uh, there's another one uh, by Intel called Loihi, and Intel actually recently scaled Loihi up with packing many, many of those, of those chips together. Um, but in those systems, um, the, the neuron and the synapses used to emulate the brain is still um, designed using conventional CMOS devices. So they are designed to emulate the functions and the behavior of the, uh, the, the properties and the, uh, uh, 
the elements in your brain, but they are not native. Uh, so in the sense that it, you require a large circuit just to emulate a synaptic device or neuron element. So it's not as efficient. So what we want to do is actually uh, to build some devices and, uh, and obviously you need new materials to do that and develop those materials and devices so that you can natively and feasibly uh, emulate the biological system. So, we, uh, so obviously there are different philosophies, but the philosophy we believe in is that by, if you can do that, you can actually build hardware as efficient or even more efficient and faster than the, uh, the brain can perform, right? So that's basically our goal. Uh, we are not trying to build this completely with existing devices. We actually want to see what, uh, what new circuits can build with these new materials and new devices. So uh, to do that, we actually need to understand what a synapse and the neuron is, right? So neuron, uh, mostly we leave it alone because uh, there are just uh, many more synapses than, than neurons. So for neuron, you can possibly still use the CMOS circuit to, uh, to, to emulate it. But there are just 10,000 times more synapses than neurons. So for synapses, you can't afford to do that. So if you look at what a synapse is, right? So obviously that's where the learning and the memory uh, occur. So um, uh, first, it's a dynamic device. It's not just a transistor where you turn it on and off. Uh, its property can change. Uh, more specifically, uh, it has a weight. And this weight will evolve based on the history of the uh, spiking buds from pre and post synaptic neurons, right? So, uh, so it's not a fixed device. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, you can't use a fixed circuit to emulate this. Uh, but what caused the synaptic weight to change? If you look beyond the surface, you will see the weight change is actually caused by a very complex uh, physical and chemical processes. So even though a synapse looks very simple, uh, from a circuit point of view, it's a two-terminal device, but there's actually a lot of processes going on and uh, that actually uh, allows the synaptic weight to change following certain uh, so-called rules, right? So, um, so if you want to build this efficiently, uh, ideally we want to find a device that's something like this, right? It's a two-terminal look from the outside, it look very simple, but inside it actually offers a lot of um, uh, dynamic processes that can emulate uh, the fundamental physical and chemical processes of a synapse. So if you can do that, you can then uh, say we can feasibly emulate this uh, uh, biological device and we can natively do that. We can natively map uh, uh, an, a bio-inspired neural network very efficiently. Okay, so that's basically what the angle we are uh, uh, coming from. So, uh, so the question is that, uh, does this material even exist? Uh, in fact, it does exist. And in fact, it, people have known this effect for many decades. Um, so, uh, so this device, obviously, they are not simple electrical devices. And uh, we call them coupled electronic and ionic devices. Um, because in you know, synapse, there's uh, this physical and chemical processes involved, not just uh, 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 resistance, it's actually there's uh, ions being moved around, for example, cal calcium ion concentration being changed, then it causes um, neurotransmitter activity to change and what, uh, what not, right? So there's chemical processes involved. Uh, so we want to find a, a solid state device that can offer similar properties. And, uh, and this, as I mentioned earlier, these materials do exist. So in one case, uh, so you can start with a very simple material, like a dielectric material. Uh, for example, even silicon dioxide. What can happen is that obviously silicon dioxide is very trivial material, but what can happen is that you can put another material on top. Uh, this one can be, for example, copper or silver. Then uh, when you apply a field, uh, kind of like a uh, you know, synapse when you uh, drive it with a, uh, a spike, right? When you apply a field, you can actually ionize the, the silver atoms from the electrode into silver ions. And the, the electric field can actually drive the silver ions into the silicon dioxide and all the way, for example, to the castle. And during this process, you'll, the ions will go through this oxidation and eventually reduction process. And in between, it actually has a, a migration process. It will hop over a, barrier, a few barriers, right? So, uh, so these are actually chemical processes. And uh, so by doing so, it's not just, you are not just changing the electrical property of the silicon dioxide. In the end, you actually physically create a new structure in the silicon dioxide. In this case, in the end, you can accumulate enough silver atoms in silicon dioxide, you can actually form a so-called conducting filament, okay? Um, so, uh, and this process is reversible if you control it well, okay? So this effect actually people first uh, observed in the uh, 1960s, but it wasn't, uh, the technology wasn't there, it's not very controllable. 
So um, around 2004 and 2003 and 2004, we actually started making these devices, and we found it can be a can, uh, can be uh, this effects can be reproduced in a very uh, reproducible fashion and can be scaled down to a nano scale uh, and actually make reliable devices. Okay, so that's one device where you can. Again, just like in biology, you can actually move ions. So it's uh, more than just a, a electrical effect. It's actually a chemical device in this sense as well. So, uh, so there's another type of device, uh, not by moving metal ions, you can move oxygen ions, right? So here you have two oxides, okay? If you have two, have two oxides, one of the layer is a so-called stoichiometric oxide. So it's basically insulator uh, with very few defects. Another layer has a lot of oxygen vacancies. So these are defects, these are just a, a uh, you remove some oxygen uh, ions from this material and it becomes conductive and because this uh, oxygen vacancy defects uh, can act as dopants. Again, the dopants are not fixed in, uh, in space. So when you apply um, a spike or voltage pulse, you can actually move the oxygen vacancies. Uh, for example, from this layer to the second layer, which is uh, originally a deficient of oxygen vacancies. Now, if you move enough oxygen vacancies into this layer, uh, the second layer, now the whole film becomes uh, conducting. Um, so now the resistance of the device will change, okay? So uh, similarly for the first uh, type of device, when you form the metal filament, the resistance of the whole device will change from a very high resistance state, uh, simply conducting through the silicon dioxide, now can, conducting, uh, can conduct through the uh, metal filament, okay? So, uh, so by doing so, we are actually coding, we can use the electric field um, and cause chemical reactions happen inside the device. And if, in some sense, you can argue that you are physically reconfiguring the material. In one case, you created a new material on the fly. So you build the circuit, everything is completed after the fab, uh, and, uh, but you can reconfigure, uh, regrow a new material inside the original material um, uh, uh, on the fly with a, simply with the electric field. Or you can train, move the dopant, right? You can train the, um, the chemical composition of the material by training the uh, metal to oxygen vacancy ratio. So you're basically changing the chemical composition in the material, again, on the fly. So these are devices we feel that can actually potentially uh, feasibly emulate the synaptic devices and allow us to build very efficient circuits, okay? So, um, so uh, obviously these are just a, a series, these are very simple uh, schematics, but you can verify this. So this is actually some experimental study we did. And this is a, just like what I we discussed earlier. So this is a silicon dioxide. And this is uh, obviously done um, uh, on a, a device structure, so you can imagine, uh, uh, do a, a TM uh, analysis. So here is after programming the device, you can actually see a silver a wire, a silver filament uh, being formed inside the silicon dioxide layer between the top and bottom electrode. Okay. And then, so we published this paper. Then, uh, uh, then uh, some people really got uh, obviously very interested, and uh, then we also got some questions how you can actually move these items. And in this case, this silver filament is actually quite large, even though they are a few nanometers, but silicon oxide film simply doesn't have the space to accommodate it, right? So how, how can you move this big cluster of silver uh, in the solid state film? So traditional electrochemistry people, they, they think it's possible uh, in liquids, obviously, and in, um, in, in polymers or conventional electrolyte. Uh, they don't think it's, uh, it's feasible or controllable in this uh, conventional solid state dielectric, right? So how can you do that? So we did another study where we, uh, we basically, instead of uh, looking at the filament, we look at the individual particles because that's actually easier to, uh, to capture. So we look at how these individual silver particles can actually move in this very dense solid state medium, right? So, um, so in this study, we, we basically invite the silver particle inside the silicon dioxide and it's between the two electrodes. So basically it's a capacitor structure. And when you apply a field, this silver particle is not connected to anything. It's just see the electric field, right? So hopefully I can play this video. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, then we we'll apply a positive voltage here and negative voltage there. So you will see uh, this is an in situ TEM study. So what you will see that you will watch this silver particle. And hopefully over time you will see that um, this particle actually start to change its shape. And this side is so-called anode side because it's going to be positively charged and this side is cathode side of the particle. You will see that the anode side actually start to lose um, silver atoms one by one and eventually a new particle start to appear. So what happens if I stop here? Uh, can, uh, okay. I didn't stop, sorry about that. Um, okay, 
Um, yeah, so uh, suppose I stopped the video here, then you can see that uh, the original particle starts to shrink and it doesn't shrink uniformly. It starts to shrink from the anode side. So it starts to lose um, silver atoms from this side because this is the anode side, it's positive charge. So as I explained earlier, this side, you start to lose silver atoms into the form of silver uh, ions. And see silver ion will migrate in the direction of the electric field. In this case, it will migrate very small distance, then be reduced, and it capture electron inside the film and will be reduced and form this new cluster. Then over time, this eventually this new uh, or original cluster disappears and this all the silver atoms are moved to this new location. So obviously you can't move this cluster at once. There's simply no, uh, no space for it, but you are actually, what's happening is that you are moving these atoms one by one. So that's quite interesting. So normally when people think about controlling the atoms, right, in real time, you think about doing it at very low temperature and using a, a, a scan tunneling microscopes a type of equipment. But here you can actually do that, um, controlling the atoms individually uh, in, at room temperature in a circuit by simply applying electric field. So that's what we found. It's actually quite an interesting process. So this is another type of device. As I mentioned, these are oxide-based devices. We also started them. So in this case, you have two layers. One is the uh, oxygen-deficient layer. So in this case, it's tantalum pentoxide, uh, which is a stoichiometric layer. And you remove some oxygen ions in the layer, it becomes tantalum suboxide. So the suboxide in TEM will be uh, become uh, show uh, 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 as a darker layer because it can uh, absorb electrons, it's more conducting. And the other layer is insulating, so it can appear as a white layer in TM. So uh, in this device, it's hard to actually see the oxygen vacancy movement. So we, uh, we can have some indirect evidence uh, uh, after switching, but we also do a lot of simulation. So this is actually by solving a couple of equations of ion movement uh, redox process and uh, electron conduction, which uh, determines the electric field distribution and the uh, thermal equation. So anyway, by solving this set of a couple of equations, you can actually predict the, the migration of the, um, the, uh, the oxygen vacancies and the associated device conductance. So, uh, so here on the right, we show that uh, this is actually simulated, the current versus voltage. And you can see that, uh, so uh, let's wait for the dot to move. So when you, for example, start here, the device will have a high resistance. Then after some time, it will jump. Uh, that's because you move enough oxygen vacancy from the bottom layer to the top. So the uh, red color means you have a higher concentration of oxygen vacancy. So here we have the filament form. And uh, then you apply a negative voltage, you can actually remove the oxygen vacancy from switching layer, then uh, the device becomes insulated again. So again, this device show a recent change, but this, this change is actually driven by this fundamental um, coupled ionic and electronic processes. So it's actually not just the electronic device, it's a coupled ionic electronic device, okay. So, uh, so the first application that you can think about it is to simply use this as a memory because the device has different resistance levels, then you can just store data with the different resistance levels, right? That's what people are uh, doing and it's already been commercialized. Uh, so for this application, it's called resistive random access memory. So RRAM for short. Uh, and some people call it a memory star. So it's a memory device uh, uh, and it's basically a resistor with memory in fact. So it's called a memory star. So it's a very good memory device in this regard because uh, it only needs two terminals, right? So for any device, you need two terminals, one terminal to send data, one to collect data, right? So in this device, you only need two terminals. There's no third terminal like a transistor, you need a gate. Here, you don't need a gate. Um, but with a two terminal, you can, you can program the device, you can read the device, you can uh, reconfigure the device, right? So that's very, very uh, interesting. So it's very, give you a very high density. And you can also build this called crossbars where you have an array of those two terminal devices. So at each cro cross point, you have a cross of a top and bottom electrode, right? So you have a device at each cross point. So that's the, the most compact form. You can build an array of devices. Then because the device is not based on uh, silicon transistors, you can actually stack them up. So it can be fabricated at low temperature, then you can stack it up. So they give you a very fast programming and read and a very large uh, uh, dynamic range to store your uh, zero and one, and also very high density. So that's why uh, people are very interested in this type of device uh, as a memory device. So this is what I mentioned earlier. You can then integrate this on top of transistor. Uh, so again, this is a, a, 
uh, further improve the, the density of the overall system. Uh, so uh, as Bob mentioned, I actually uh, co-founded a company called Crossbar in 2010 uh, to commercialize this. In fact, this is already being offered uh, uh, at 12 nano, uh, at, no, at 12, uh, 12 inch wafers at uh, 40 and 28 nanometer. And in fact, uh, other fabs, uh, including TSMC, are also offering these devices as a commercial memory device. Okay, so this is actually quite a mature technology. Uh, but that's not the topic of my uh, focus on my talk. So what I want we want to do is to actually use these devices for computing. Uh, first, this is actually driven by the fact that uh, 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 already it's be, uh, being commercialized, so we have to think about new directions, right? So when we think about this, uh, it just appears to us, uh, it just makes perfect sense to try to use this to emulate a synaptic device, okay? So we started, uh, uh, working on this as a memory device in 2000, around 2004, and we started uh, basically trying to use them as a, um, a synaptic device for neuromorphic computing back around 2008. So, uh, so the concept is very simple, right? So you basically use, use this to emulate a synapse uh, in a biological network or any neural network. Then you can convert this neural network topology again into this crossbar topology, right? So here, these are your input neurons, these are your output neurons. So each new input neuron can be connected to a, a array of output neurons and vice versa. And they are connected through these reconfigurable connections uh, of these memory stars or RM devices. And you can change the resistance of these RM devices, again, based on the spikes you apply to the network. Um, so, um, so mathematically, how do we do computing? It also becomes very uh, straightforward. So the math is actually very easy to understand. So, if you look at uh, the machine learning models or any other neural networks, right, the most fundamental operation, it turned out to be a vector matrix multiplication. And so in fact, in the, the, the most fundamental feature of a neural network is to do pattern matching. So how do you tell if an input pattern is matched with a stored pattern? You basically compare the two vectors. You convert the input uh, pattern into a vector and you compare the, the stored pattern is another vector, right, it's just a weight vector. And uh, these are high dimensional input. So you compare them and how do you see if they are matched? You just compare their dot product. If they are matched, they give you the largest dot product, right? If they are uh, orthogonal, they give you a zero dot product, right? So you basically perform the dot product, you can do pattern matching. Um, but you have many uh, features uh, stored in a, in a system, right? In your brain and in a neural network. So basically you want to compare all of them in parallel. So you basically do a vector matrix multiplication. Uh, so it's basically a series of, uh, uh, an array of dot products per, uh, 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 performed in parallel. So, uh, so typically it's actually very expensive to do the vector matrix multiplication. Uh, so in conventional system, you have to read the input vector and read the, uh, the, the weight vector and do a multiplication separately and store your dot product uh, in another memory device, right? Here you can actually do it in, in place because now the memory star is a, a resistive device, right? So uh, you can use the resistance to store the weights. And um, when you want to do the dot product, you apply a voltage. The voltage uh, can represent, for example, the amplitude of the uh, input vector. Um, so uh, this voltage value multiplied by the resistance uh, through Ohm's law or conductance through Ohm's law simply, uh, then that give you a current. So the current is then as a result is the multiplication of your input uh, voltage and the stored weight value, which is represented by the conductance. Um, but then you can add, uh, apply a vector of the inputs, right? You have the first input, that's your first element in the vector, plus a second input, that's a second uh, 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 voltage pulse uh, in the vector. And then again, the second element of the input will be multiplied with the second weight value in the uh, weight vector. So the, the final current output is again through Kirchhoff's current law is just uh, the uh, complete, uh, exactly represents the vector vector dot product output. And uh, in this crossbar array, you can read more than just one output, you can read all these uh, uh, columns output in parallel. So again, this a single read then give you this vector matrix multiplication in a single step. There's no need to read out the weights and perform computing separately. And so that's where you can do the computing in place and in parallel, okay? So it's uh, not, many cores in parallel. In, in, in fact, you can call this a core, and within a core, you are processing the element-wise computations in parallel. So this is so-called fine green parallelism that gives you the, the ultimate parallelism you can, you, uh, you can achieve in this vector multi, uh, matrix multiplications. 
So if you can implement this, you can actually map many uh, common um, algorithms uh, nat natively because all these al algorithms are based on vector vector modifications or vector matrix modifications. So the other nice thing about this device is that it turned out that because the device is bidirectional, it's a resistor, right? It's bidirectional. You can read the current in this way that give you an input vector multiplied by the weight matrix. You can read the current in the opposite direction. You can feed the input from the, the column direction and read the current from the rows, right? That, if you look at the math, that give you, um, so uh, normally in, a, uh, in an algorithm, this output neural output are so-called activation. So then your activation becomes the input, then it becomes the activation vector multiplied by the transpose of the weight matrix. And that, if you go through the math, that just give, give us so-called reconstruction. Um, so again, this turned out to be a very useful few, uh, uh, vector because in machine learning, they want to compare our the reconstruction, which is uh, a P dagger with uh, a P head with the original P, uh, which is the original input and find out the error. So again, this is actually a very important value that needs to be computed very often as well. So uh, again, it's uh, very expensive to compute, but now we can get this also for free using the same hardware, uh, which is through a simple transpose uh, read. Okay, and transpose, again, this is actually very difficult to implement, very expensive to implement in conventional hardware. So, uh, so with that, then everything becomes very simple. So obviously, IC simple is actually my student took a lot of time to, to build it, but uh, in principle, it becomes just uh, become implementation. Okay, so we build um, several systems uh, over the years. So this is the original system where I will simply show that you can integrate this crossbar array with CMOS, so those dots are vias. For CMOS transistors, it's connected to CMOS circuitry underneath, okay? And uh, um, then we showed you can actually uh, do computing, this is actually at the board level, do this both forward and backward uh, uh, passes to get your, uh, your uh, forward uh, uh, propagation and the uh, reconstruction through the back, uh, transpose uh, uh, propagation. So this is actually done at the board level like this. And then uh, last year, we actually showed that you can do this with a complete uh, a device. So this is a, a complete chip we build with uh, our collaborators, where uh, we have a co conventional digital processor. We have our uh, crossbar arrays that does uh, Mac operations. We have uh, reconfigurable logic that can map different uh, networks on the same chip. Okay, this is actually the chip we build. So uh, with that, you can show a uh, different algorithm, right? You can do a, uh, apply a so-called sparse coding algorithm where you apply input uh, of uh, image pixels at your input. Then uh, not only do you get forward uh, uh, propagation, you can also have the neurons to literally compete with each other. Again, this is also through some uh, vector matrix uh, impl implementation. So I'm not going through the details here. Um, you can read this paper if you're interested. But you can implement not just forward passes, you can also implement later inhibitions among neurons, okay? And um, in this more recent demonstration, we showed you can map not just a single layer, you can map multiple layers on the same chip. Uh, again, because the, the chip doesn't care, the array doesn't care which operations you use, which models you use, it just implements this uh, uh, vector matrix modifications for your different models. Okay. Um, so, so that's very nice demonstration. Then the next we were thinking, trying to find out is that, can we actually build larger systems, right? Because uh, we can build these small arrays uh, as a research project, right? But the actual models people use now are much larger, right? Now the models have hundreds of millions of weights, right? The arrays we build have a few thousand weights, right? How do you actually uh, use those small arrays to actually map a physical model that may need a uh, 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 thousand of those arrays, right? So obviously you can't build one big crossbar to do that. Uh, if you want to build one big crossbar, first uh, it's become e very inefficient. You have a very rigid system. Second, uh, the, the circuit line data is, for example, the line resistance will completely uh, dominate this analog computing accuracy. So that will kill the performance. So we came up with a tiled architecture. So um, uh, obviously there are many people working on different tiles ar architecture, but in our case, we have this analog crossbar arrays tiled through digi digital interface uh, to actually build a larger system. So we have done some study to show this is actually feasible and you can actually map uh, very efficiently a large model onto uh, these smaller arrays. So this is one example we published last year at IEDM to show uh, uh, several models this is, uh, uh, mapping, for example, uh, uh, mobile net, and you can actually see how we can map this into these smaller arrays without losing accuracy of this larger model. And this is actually a, a 
another interesting uh, uh, progress we made is actually through another startup we, we founded and, uh, in 2019, and we actually built a silicon actually that implement these kind of models. And this actually was uh, uh, demonstrated live at the CES, uh, basically when CF was still uh, uh, possible before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, so that was actually demonstrated in January 2020, showing that you can actually achieve this. This is actually using TSMC RM, and you can actually do that very, very reliably. So, uh, so this summarizes my uh, first, uh, the first part of my talk uh, is that we we try to build a circuit that can be uh, that are inspired by the brain. So, where we just want to build a very efficient circuit that can implement these functions, right? We use this uh, 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 this solid state synaptic devices to emulate the synapses, and it can allow us to do this very efficient computing, um, uh, where we have the memory and the logic in the same device and uh, we have very high degree of parallelism. So this can potentially give us, for example, more than 100 times better energy uh, efficiency and throughput, okay? And, uh, uh, and also it's reconfigurable. Uh, there are still a lot of challenges uh, to make it very reliable at larger scale and improve the efficiency, but overall this is a very interesting direction and very promising direction in my opinion. But the more interesting part, uh, we feel that, uh, I mean, obviously as scientists, we always try to find New, new directions, right? Now this, this becomes seem like uh, mature enough that may be commercialized. We also want to look at new directions. So what we feel is that these new materials and new devices can actually offer much more uh, than just being uh, uh, emulating synaptic devices as an um, uh, analog computing element. So, um, so one thing that has been fascinated, for example, neuroscientists uh, for many, uh, many years, right? Is that a synapse um, can uh, respond to spikes not to the number of spikes or the amplitude of a spike. It responds to the timing of the spike, right? So that's what makes the biological system even more efficient because spikes are discrete events. Most of the time, there's no spike. Um, so if, it's, uh, the, if the learning and the memory is formed by the timing, then it's really, really efficient. Most of the time, you don't do anything. You only make some changes when you have these uh, 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 discrete events, right? So it's very sparse discrete events that can cause uh, computation and learning. Um, but the question is that, how does this device even um, recognize different timing, right? Normally when you uh, implement timing in your circuit, we have a clock, but this device obviously doesn't have a clock. So how does it even uh, recognize the timing information? Uh, when different spikes arrive at different uh, timing, it will cause a weight, a synaptic weight to change differently. So how does this simple device recognize uh, the timing information? So, uh, so we did some study and obviously the, the neuroscientists, they speak different languages, but in the end, uh, what we feel is that, in fact, this device does have an internal clock, uh, even though it doesn't have a digital circuit, it does have a, a, a internal uh, timing mechanism, not a clock, but a timing mechanism. So what is the internal timing mechanism? It turned out to be uh, due to some dynamic processes in, in the device. So uh, to change the synaptic weight, it turned out that this calcium contribution becomes very important. And this calcium contribution actually will increase and decay uh, depending on the, um, uh, the uh, neural uh, receptor activity from the presynaptic neuron and the depolarization uh, in the postsynaptic neuron. Again, I'm not, not a neuroscientist, so I will just uh, repeat what I learned here, right? So, um, so in this case, for example, if the uh, presynaptic neuron ar arrives, right, and uh, it will increase the activity of the neural uh, NMDA receptor activity, and this uh, activity effect will decay, okay? And it has some short time constant. If no postsynaptic neuron uh, uh, arrive, then nothing really happens. The calcium country never will reach above a threshold. But if a postsynaptic neuron, which is the right one, increase, uh, arrives, then it will change the depolarization and this combined effect will increase the calcium country to a certain, uh, above a certain threshold that will cause uh, the synaptic weight to change. And how much these two effects combine with each other then depend on their relative timing because this is a short-term dynamics. So this effect is strongest when they are very close and when they are further apart, this overlap becomes weaker, okay? So that native decay actually very conveniently provides a relative a timing mechanism that can allow the synaptic to, a synapse to actually distinguish the relative timing or decode the relative timing from the pre and the post native. Uh, spikes. And whether the post-synaptic event occurs before or after the pre-synaptic event also leads to different uh, calcium concentration. Okay, so that becomes really, really interesting. So 
so uh, around 20, uh, 2010, that's when we started to see if we can try to emulate this effect. So we can also process the timing information uh, natively rather than just the amplitude of the inputs, but the timing of the inputs natively. So again, this is due to the internal dynamics of the synapse. Right? It's a very complex system with hundreds of proteins. But if you look at the memristor, you can argue it's basically a poor man's synapse. So it doesn't have all these uh, rich um, types of proteins, but still you have these um, chemical processes that are driven by um, uh, activation energy and uh, they can also have short-term effects. For example, you can have uh, drift, you can have diffusion. So you can actually have a filament formed, then you can lose it due to diffusion, right? And uh, um, uh, you can also have a temperature increase. For example, when you uh, uh, give it an electrical pulse, you can temporarily heat up the device. So this temperature then facilitate, facilitate um, the, uh, the migration of the ions and the chemical reaction of the ions. So then, but then the temperature effect can decay if the, nothing happens uh, soon after the, the initial pulse. So again, you can take advantage of those dynamic processes to actually emulate the process more faithfully. So we call this device a second order memory star. Uh, so we, we are very proud to give it a name here. So uh, it's called second order because uh, normally we consider one state variable, that's the weight of the synapse. But here uh, for, the synaptic to, uh, feel, for the synapse to change its weight, it has to um, go through two processes. Uh, so involving two state variables. The first state variable uh, only produce a short term effect. Uh, so for example, in this case, the internal temperature, it doesn't uh, change the weight, but it, uh, it allows the, 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 the synaptic weight to change differently based on the uh, relative timing. Uh, so for example, here, this is the first spike, this is the second spike. Uh, the first spike can increase the temperature. And if the, the second spike occurs much later, nothing will really happen because and the ions don't have enough energy to move. But if, if they are close enough, then it can increase the temperature to a high enough degree, then the ions can actually migrate at a moderate uh, field in the second synapse, the, uh, in the second spike. Then you can actually start to train the device uh, uh, weight or the synaptic weight. And this weight change then depends on the relative timing because the temperature depends on the relative timing. So that seems to be a very neat trick to actually emulate the synaptic behavior to the um, spike timing from, uh, uh, in inputs. So with that, we can actually natively implement uh, different learning rules without even knowing what the rules are, uh, because the rules are actually um, uh, phenomenological. They are just uh, 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 they are they are just observing an effect. They are actually not uh, 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 not describing the cause. They are actually just describing the effect, right? So there are so-called spike timing dependent plasticity rule, uh, which states that uh, when the pre and post negative uh, events are close to each other, it will cause a larger change in the snaps. Uh, synaptic weight, and if the pre-spike occurs before the post-spike, it will cause a positive change, otherwise it will cause a negative change, right? Uh, so that seems natural, but again, the SNAPs actually implement this rule through these fundamental uh, chemical processes. I do not know this rule exists, it's just native, uh, natively implemented, right? So we try to build devices that can do that, and also um, show a dependence on spike rate. So again, spike rate is, you, you only have spikes from one, uh, one side, for example, from the pre synaptic side, but you can have the spikes coming very frequently or infrequently. Again, the relative timing can cause the synaptic weight to change differently. Again, here we are using one device. Uh, the same uh, physical processes don't know what the rules are, what, where the spikes are coming. It will just na natively uh, show the behavior uh, people observe in biology. So in fact, uh, if you, you can have devices that only have short-term memory, they don't have long-term memory. So these are basically bad memory devices, right? You program a device, it increases the conductance, then the conductance will decay, okay? Um, this short-term memory effect can also be used for computing because now you apply a series of inputs that are temporal inputs, right? So again, depending on the relative timing, if you have several inputs that are close to each other, you can keep increasing the device conductance. But if there's no inputs, the device conductance will decay. And then the final device conductance then depends not only uh, on the number of inputs, but on the, uh, the, the, uh, the relative timing, the basically temporal pattern of the inputs. So we did, uh, this is, uh, you, can, you can build devices that show this behavior uh, very uh, easily. And uh, you can basically, for example, do a test. Here you have uh, four inputs, then a different combination of the position in time 
Uh, so one reference a, time, a pulse at this given time, zero means no pulse, right? Different combination can lead to distinct response of the device, okay? So, but the device doesn't have long-term memory. Uh, so in the end, they all decay to the resting state, right? So the question is that how do you use this for computing? In fact, uh, again, first, short-term memory is the important effect in, even in biology, right? But second, uh, people actually, uh, again, we didn't develop the algorithm, but uh, this is already existed in the uh, computing uh, science uh, literature. So people developed a, a system that can perform computing using only in this short-term memory. So this effect, this effect, this system is called a reservoir computing system. So basically you have a reservoir that uh, the weights don't change. So what you are doing is that you are only exciting the nodes in the reservoir. So by uh, different temporal inputs will excite the reservoir to different state. And uh, so from a mathematical view, this reservoir basically performs a nonlinear transformation of the input. So the original input can be very hard to separate. Um, it can be, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, if you use, uh, for example, it's a series of pulses, it just become hard to separate from another series of pulses. But if you uh, if do this nonlinear transformation, you project it into a high, higher dimensional space, then it becomes linearly separable. So that's basically what the reservoir does. So it's not trained, it doesn't, you don't have to train, but you just need to excite it. And in fact, some people argue this is also what's going on a lot of times in our brain as well. We don't train the weights, we just excite the, the neurons, right? And this neuron excitations actually leads us to respond differently. So with that, we can actually build this reservoir system with even a single device. Obviously, if you use more devices, you increase the dimension of the reservoir, you make the, uh, the system work more reliably. So here, this is the first example where we showed that you can use this reservoir, this is to process image. So we convert the spatial data into temporal data. For example, this row is uh, per, uh, converted into a series of pulses and it will excite one device and different rows will excite different devices. And the combination of the device state uh, represents the reservoir state and this can be used to separate the, the different images of uh, what they are representing. So with that, you can actually get a reasonable performance with a tiny network with only 88 devices. This is a, a tiny network. So, um, so then we moved forward to use this to actually process actual uh, temporal data. This is actually for speech recognition. So again, for speech, you first pre-process it, you separate it into a frequency channels, and in each frequency channel, you have your spike trains, right? These are your, uh, your, spoke, uh, your words spoken in different time, right? So you, you basically, you are, these are a spike train. You feed this spike train to your device, and you excite your device, a combination of the device from the reservoir. So again, you look at the frequency from different frequency channels and temporal uh, patterns will spike, uh, will excite the reservoir into different states and the, the different states can be used to uh, distinguish different words you use, right? So with that, you can actually get a very good accuracy uh, for spoken digits, okay, very efficiently. But more interestingly, because we can detect the, the, the actual temporal features, temporal patterns in the device, you can use it to do projection. So in one study, we showed that you can actually get a very good performance, almost like this, without the speaker completes the word because you already know what the word is because you know the temporal feature, right? Uh, the other thing you can do with that, you can uh, let the system do uh, long-term prediction. So what this means is that you learn the special, uh, you learn the temporal patterns of the system, then you predict the next, um, next um, input. So use your system to predict the next input, then you feed the predicted next input to your system, right? So, uh, so this system just evolves on, but it's used to basically uh, forecast the original system. So you don't know what the original system will behave, but you learn enough temporal features, you can actually use this uh, system to actually predict it. So that's actually very difficult to do for long term. So in this case, we started a chaotic system. Um, so chaotic systems are really, really hard to uh, predict, especially long-term because they will diverge exponentially. So here, uh, again, you the very small network because these uh, devices can actually capture the very diverse temporal features, we can actually get very good accuracy and get very good prediction long-term. So I'll not go into the details here. Um, so this is actually an interesting plot. So here we plot the phase plot of the chaotic system, okay? So, um, so we plot, the ground truth, which we don't know, but obviously in experiment we do know we are not using it. Uh, so we can compare it with the long-term predicted results. 
So what you can see that the, the actual experimental system actually predict this chaotic system very well. But over time, it start to uh, uh, skip a, 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 a point in, in time, okay? So we'll see they actually differ a little bit uh, because the, the experiment skipped a, a point. And, uh, but it's still capturing the same chaotic system. It's actually not uh, predicting a different system. It's still predicting the same system, but it just differs by, a, a, by one time constant. Um, but in this interesting case is that you can see the, the uh, actual system is actually ahead of the ground truth. The ground truth is actually following the prediction, which, uh, which obviously is not true because they are just evolving independently. But this is actually shows this actually can be used uh, uh, very well for predicting this very difficult system. So even though there are some error, but this error is not because we actually are predicting uh, the wrong system. It's actually um, or because of this shift uh, or skip. But in this case, we're actually predicting further in the future. So it's actually not too bad. Um, so we'll try to quickly wrap up. So uh, another interesting direction is actually uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Dan He, uh, Kim's group uh, at Harvard is uh, trying to actually uh, see if we can actually use this reservoir system to um, process actual biological spike trends, right? So we, there we, uh, previously we use a, a voltage process, but you can argue a, a spike is a voltage pulse, right? So the question is that, can you actually use this to process actually uh, recorded biological spikes? That's actually very uh, interesting and challenging because uh, Dan He and Hong Kong, they developed this very nice electrode arrays. They can collect a lot of, collect a lot of data from thousands of uh, neuron recording sites, but it's very hard to process all the data. It's just too much data to process, right? So with this very efficient neural networks, we can actually do this in real time. Uh, we can process the streaming data in real time, right? So, um, so ideally, we want to do it without any pre-processing, pre without any application, right? We want to integrate our network directly on the uh, uh, nanoelectrode arrays, right? So to do that, you need a device that can directly respond to um, the biological spikes. So basically your electrical synapse will directly respond to the biological spike, right? So first we develop a device that can be programmed at very low voltage and current. So this device can respond to 70 millivolt, right? 70 millivolt less than one nanoamp. So theoretically, they can indeed be excited by just a biological spike, uh, which is about a uh, uh, 70 millivolt and uh, 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 doesn't have enough energy, right? So we can do that. Uh, then uh, we also, this is actually uh, through uh, a simulation, uh, not simulation, through emulated spikes, but experimentally you, you know, our devices because we haven't integrated our device uh, on uh, down his electrode array yet. Uh, so we're just using uh, uh, very small electrode spikes to emulate the biological spikes, but we can see that this um, network can indeed distinguish different spiking patterns. And in fact, uh, if you read this paper, we, all, we also discuss it can be used to dis, uh, dis, uh, detect the neuron connectivity patterns. And in this case, we showed it can also be used to detect the transition from one firing pattern to another. And because the, the, fire, the temporal pattern is changing and we can detect that. So, um, so there are other interesting materials we started. Uh, this is actually a, a multi-desoffited material uh, we started not just because 2D is an interesting material, but in this case, we feel that 2D materials actually uh, give us a, a, a very uh, interesting angle because now we are controlling the ion movement. In 3D, it's harder to control the ion movement because it just, uh, uh, we know, I mean, if, if you are physicists, you know that three dimensional system is just uh, very different from 2D and 1D. And um, 1D and 2D, the, the dimension is just much more reduced. Uh, uh, that's there are some fundamental like for example disorder behaviors are very different in those systems as well right so uh, here we we are showing because we are moving ions again in 3D there's uh, the the space is just uh, unlimited in such way but in 2D they can only move in plane okay that forces the ions to move between the devices um, fabricated in plane and that can lead to coupling of the devices directly through the exchange of ions again very similar to, uh, or we hope, will be very similar to what's going on in biology. So it's, they are not coupled through some electrical uh, circuit feedback, but directly through ion exchange, okay? So here we show that by moving lithium ion in molydisulfide, you can indeed, again, change the resistance of this uh, device uh, incrementally, gradually increase or decrease it. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, as a said, in fact, we observe you can cause some uh, interesting phase transitions by simply applying electrical voltage, you can have enough ions 
in this model that soft layer it will cause uh, a phase transition from 2H phase to 1T prime phase. But that's not the main focus of that study. The study is to actually see that you can actually um, uh, these two ion exchange among the devices. So uh, this is one example where we show that you have two devices. You can actually show they can either work uh, cooperatively or competitively and these two different behaviors, again, by de uh, determined by how they exchange ion. Okay. So I feel overall this could be even uh, more interesting and more, uh, more promising direction than the first part I, I discussed earlier, where we simply use the, the, um, this uh, um, memory state devices to, uh, as an analog device to do computing, uh, which is very efficient by itself and can be hopefully commercialized very soon. But this new direction can lead us to build even more interesting um, circuits and uh, networks that uh, can be more efficient because they are directly dealing with spikes uh, in a very, uh, very sparsely and discrete domain rather than a continuous input, which is not as efficient. So potentially you can also uh, hopefully couple this directly with the nano electrode arrays that may, may possibly even lead to very efficient brain machine interfaces. Okay. Um, yeah, so that just summarizes uh, uh, what I discussed here. Hopefully I didn't run over time too long. And I, so yeah, so I'll just stop here. Uh, thanks for your attention. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. A little virtual clapping here in the, <laughs> in the universe. Um, any questions? A good way to ask a question is through the chat um, chat line if you just type it in um, as a chat, and then we can read it off. And Emily can read it and ask a question. Yep. I guess I have one one to uh, to follow, follow uh, start with is this uh, new chip of uh, uh, Don He in Hong Kong, uh, where you actually put a uh, neuron recorder that can actually get real data from like more than two neurons, but like lots mm -hmm. of neurons all coming in at once is fantastic, I think. But, there, but it, the big question is that you said, how on earth do you know what just happened? And uh, do you think that you can actually make a processor that will go there on the next layer on that chip and then uh, send, uh, you know, the di digested uh, information to the outside? Yes, that's that's basically we wrote a proposal from SF and uh, somehow got funded, and that's exactly what we plan to do. Yes, oh, we want to actually okay. yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we want to actually build a network on their chip and write um, write uh, after each electrode, uh, basically each nano electrode, right? So each nano electrode or a few of the nano electrode is connected to one neuron. We want to process um, the the spikes from individual neurons uh, directly uh, on on the chip without having to send it to a computer. Yeah. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah. And then I'll do it in a way so you make, there's also this bridge to getting the, over to the, the, the medical community and so that the, uh, the real doctors can, will understand what you're talking about and they can interpret it. Yes, yes, that's definitely one of the goals, yes. yes. Yeah, good. Uh, other questions? You can also wave your hands like this, and then if we have your vision is on, okay. I guess another one, so from what you're doing at the end, so you think that you can also make these uh, memristors out of 2D materials. Mm -hmm. Is it the things like uh, in Kim's group where they're intercalating uh, uh, two layers of moly disulfide with lithium? Yes. Is that an example where if you pattern that in the right way and Yes. You make yes. that lithium slide around sideways, then you yes. can. Yes, exactly. So you use the electric field to drive the lithium ion sideways, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And get it to work. Okay. Last chance. Ask him a really pithy question. Here's <laughs> yeah, I thought for you there. No, I guess not. But thanks very much. Very impressive talk. I, I learned a lot. And this, this really uh, looks pretty good. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thanks to everyone. It's a great talking to you. And, uh, thanks for your time. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>